My talk is uh, basically a short update on my work on getting a LibreOffice built working in the WSL environment. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically we can go straight to it. Uh, what is WSL? Uh, WSL is a Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, and uh, that is uh, basically a lightweight uh, uh, emulation layer uh, that allows you to run uh, Linux distributions uh, within Windows. And uh, you can have uh, multiple different versions installed by side by side without issue. You can use uh, them simultaneously. And uh, what's also a nice feature is that you can seamlessly share files between the Linux realm and the Windows realm. And this works both ways. And also calling the applications, uh, uh, Linux tools from Windows side works by just prefixing the command with WSL and then the command in the Linux container. But you can also do the opposite way, just uh, call a Windows program by using the, the path to the Windows uh, executable from your Linux container. And uh, this virtualization doesn't block you from using other tools like VirtualBox, so those can run in addition to having a WSL system running. And uh, the WSL2 version also gained the uh, capability to use graphical applications seamlessly on your Windows uh, desktop. And uh, it's even integrated in the Windows Start menu. So if it's a default application uh, entry for this in your Linux distro, you don't have to configure anything. You can uh, type the Windows key and start typing the, uh, the first letters of the uh, uh, Linux applications, and you can run it seamlessly. And also with a pretty good uh, uh, speed. So there's no slugginess like if you were to uh, set up a manual VNC, for example, on a Linux box and try to use VNC to call into that box. There's always the delay of, of, delay of the screen refresh. But with uh, the GUI support in the WSL, there's none of that. So it's a great way to use uh, Linux tools on Windows when there's no equivalent available. But yeah, uh, why would you even consider building a Linux version when you're a Windows user? And uh, I guess the main point why I uh, started looking at, into it is the point of reliability. The Windows builds we are currently using the setup is uh, pretty flaky and it fails randomly and uh, in an unpredictable way. That doesn't mean that our uh, Linux builds are without fault, but at least the comp compilation stage, the, the building stage, is reliable. So you usually only get uh, problems when you start the testing phase, when there's uh, uh, timing issues or similar stuff. But the build itself using Linux is uh, pretty reliable and stable. And of course, it's also a matter of convenience. If you're using Windows because your bank application requires a special tool that doesn't run on Linux, or if you're a gamer and that's why your primary uh, desktop is a Windows, you don't have to set up a dual boot system or use a VM with an additional overhead to be able to use uh, Linux tools and compile LibreOffice for, for Linux, for example. And then there's a nice benefit of being able to just compile faster. On the one hand, because you can use uh, system libraries instead of compiling uh, ship versions um, quite easily on Linux, and uh, you can use Zcash, and this is especially handy if you're uh, starting from scratch uh, often. But yeah. And uh, the other point is ease of deployment, because uh, Linux machines, uh, or at least the software that is needed to build LibreOffice, is all uh, freely distributable. It's easy enough to uh, create either a recipe that other people can follow to install it in one or two command lines, or you can also create a full copy of the, uh, of the VM image that other people could then import. Yeah, and uh, 
if you're familiar with building uh, LibreOffice on Linux, then you don't have to learn anything else. It's exactly the same procedure, so you need the, the same packages, and uh, the build works exactly the same way. And as mentioned, you can use Zcash without a problem. Uh, right now on Windows, Hossein is trying to get Zcash support for Windows builds, but in my experience, it uh, on the one hand doesn't even accelerate the build compared to pre-compiled headers, and also the uh, uh, subsequent build making use of the Zcash results fails for me, for example. So none of those problems exist on Linux, so this is a way to speed up a uh, development process. And yeah, another selfish, more or less, uh, point is that it's easy enough to create the uh, release baseline with that. Uh, Alma Linux, uh, the new baseline for master branch and the new versions is uh, uh, even available as an image that can be installed using the Microsoft Store app. So you don't even have to, go to browse the internet where to find the image to import. You can just use the Microsoft Store and tell it to create an Alma Linux 8 installation and then install the packages that are listed on the wiki for the release build baseline. And yeah, as mentioned, it's possible to create exports and import uh, images. So if, if you want to use a random other distro of your choice that is not uh, readily available in the Windows Store, you can usually just start by finding a Docker image and import that and just uh, go from there. And yeah, basically, you, you are not restricted to what's available in the Microsoft Store, but basically any Linux uh, distribution can be used. It's all just a matter of preference then. And yeah, uh, speed. Again, this is probably the most important thing why people would want to use it. If you ever used uh, Git within Sigwin, I think you can appreciate how much faster it is, for example, on a Linux box or even in the uh, native Git version. And uh, yeah, I cannot underestimate how, how frustrating it is to have to wait uh, for a felt eternity for a simple git status command. And of course, this is also a problem with CI. When a build gets interrupted during the checkout phase, the repository can leave the log file behind and then it fails at tons of builds in quick succession just because the build got interrupted or aborted during the checkout stage. And yeah, uh, why then? do the effort of building the Windows version from the Linux uh, environment. And uh, to be fair, this is not something new. We used uh, Sigwin because it basically offers the same kind of environment for a build. So uh, the goal is just to replace Sigwin with a WSL instead. And uh, it still would use the Visual Studio compiler and not something like uh, min gw or something similar. Uh, it's basically just replacing Sigwin and still using all the Microsoft uh, tools for the actual build. And yeah, you might ask why you replace Sigwin. And yeah, again, the speed. Uh, Sigwin is pretty slow, especially when it comes to uh, file operations, as well as when it comes to forking new pro processes, creating new uh, instances of the processes. And, this is, of course, uh, heavily used in our build, especially when you're building with all languages or also building with help, then this uh, really hurts uh, the build time. And uh, also related to this, uh, Sigwin, especially when used on the CI system, can be quite a diva. It's uh, very uh, temperamental and there are random failures uh, that uh, basically uh, result in a failure to launch a program and Windows then just displays a dialog waiting for a user to close and dismiss the dialog for the build to actually fail. And uh, this is one of the causes for leftover issues on our CE system uh, that in the meantime were kind of worked around by just uh, taking the bot offline if it detects such a situation. But of course, this is only a workaround. It doesn't solve the problem. And with the WSL, I, I hope that is uh, a step in the direction to solving this issue. And uh, another is near yeah, problem, depending on how you look at it, is that it's hard to uh, have a single 
or a, a uniform baseline when using Sequin as a baseline because it's more or less a rolling type of uh, affair with a Sequin. So depending on when you install or set up the system, you might have different versions of the utilities and libraries installed and compared to half a year earlier. And while this hasn't been a problem recently, it has been in the past and uh, required users to, to roll back to a specific version of the Sigmund DLL and stuff like that. And of course, if you have a Linux distro that is not a, of the rolling type, then it's a much easier to, to have a, a known state, so to speak. And yeah, um, with so many things, there are too many ways to do stuff. And uh, I indicated or mentioned earlier that there's a difference between uh, working in the Linux container realm versus working on the, on the, on the Windows side. And uh, file access and stuff is speedy within WSL2, but if you were to access files from the Windows side or the opposite way, then there is uh, overhead. Uh, not quite as bad as with Sigwin, but at least a noticeable uh, drawback. And uh, the prior version of WSL didn't have this problem, so the uh, interoperability between uh, the cross-access of files was much better, but of course the uh, access times within the container would be uh, much lower, as in some cases I read it WSL to improve the within Linux access about to up to 20 times. So this is, of course, uh, one of the drawbacks you have to weigh in on deciding which way, uh, which approach you take. And yeah, uh, for the moment, I just uh, didn't go with the WSL1 approach because yeah, then you lose the, the benefits from using WSL2 for also using it as a, as a tool to create uh, Linux versions. But of course, uh, since uh, they are pretty similar, it can be tested later. And yeah, as mentioned, yeah, my approach is different from the, an initial hack that was uh, created by Tor. He, I think, tried to use it, uh, the control, control the build from the Linux container side. But uh, yeah, I didn't go that route. I wanted to have it much uh, as few things as possible from the WSL container and do as much as possible on the, on the, on the Windows side. But of course, this then uh, poses the question, uh, how do you bootstrap this environment? And uh, PowerShell or Windows uh, command uh, prompt are uh, pretty different from a bash shell. And that's why I said, uh, the, pretty risky to try to uh, to hack the, uh, our configure system into something that is uh, completely alien to what it was done before. So I basically took a shortcut, so to speak, and uh, I'm using Git Bash that can be installed from Visual Studio. And it's using MSYS2, which is similar to Sequin, basically based on Sequin, but not quite Sequin, and of course, just uh, this single component. And uh, the build then starts off by running the autogen.sh. Within the container, you see the wsl dot slash autogen.sh command. This tells it to run this command, the autogen.sh in the Linux container. And since uh, Sigwin already is a Linux-like environment, this more or less works. But of course, all the stuff that is specific to Windows uh, needed addressing. For example, we have a lot of detection for a file path that are looking up the registry. And in Sequin, uh, this is exposed using the PROC uh, pseudo file system. And yeah, of course, this is, is not available in WSL. So I had to create a little helper that just uses a, a simple bat file to get the relevant registry keys. And uh, yeah, also our configure is uh, quite inconsistent when it comes to how a file name or file path uh, should be handled. 
So there's a wild mix of uh, using Linux style path uh, versus the mixed style Windows path, which means uh, forward slashes and the traditional uh, Windows path uh, uh, or file names using the, uh, the backport slashes. And of course, this uh, also needed addressing because WSL itself only can deal with the Linux path and uh, if it accesses a, a path of the uh, Windows side, it has to be uh, using a mount path. And there's a unfortunate uh, thing regarding the difference between Sigma and WSL. Both have uh, wrapper or helper functions to convert paths between the two systems. But WSL's path convert function for example, it fails hard if it's already in the form you want to get. So if you're requesting it to get a Unix-style path and pass in an already Unix-style path, then you get an empty result. And of course, this was messy and made uh, configure very bloated in my first attempts. And yeah, uh, I decided it's not worth to spend uh, too much time on making the configure situation nice or uh, ready to, to integrate straight away. Instead, I just uh, ignored all the specifics about uh, the differences between WSL and Sigmin and just tried to make a configure pass. And then to make it actually suitable for use with WSL, I created a, a helper script that just uh, uh, modifies the values from config uh, underscore host dot mk, the, the file that it make reads with all the variables uh, that are needed for the build. All the, uh, different uh, utilities uh, out of the path. And uh, during that script, I also unify the, the path to work like that. And uh, yeah, it's not nice, uh, not uh, something that is ready to be integrated, but it will work just fine and let me uh, proceed with the rest of the work. And yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, LibreOffice is not just a single piece of software. It requires uh, or uses lots of internal stuff. And uh, every project, more or less, had, has its own little quirks here and there and uh, expect different environments whether they work best or not. And so, uh, honestly, I didn't want to, again, before even working out the main part, I didn't want to spend much time in fixing each and every external project there is, so I tried to disable using the relevant config, config switches as much as possible, and yeah, at least this got, got me going. And uh, there was an other uh, yeah, unexpected side effect of using the MSYS version of, uh, of Bash there, because it tried to convert everything that it thought was a path that didn't exist already. Uh, and example, we are using many options uh, for the compilers that start with a forward slash option, the, one of the ways on Windows to specify uh, optional flags. And this then was uh, turned by MSYS into C program files, uh, git bash uh, slash o, and of course this broke the build, obviously. And, uh, one way to fix this or address this was to change the switches to just using the hyphen style that is also supported, and this made the problem go away. Also, where there's a, a way to use double slashes at the first uh, instance of a slash, this also prevents this behavior. But of course, yeah, uh, this was a, quite a tedious uh, approach uh, and yeah, made the make files a little ugly, and especially in the with the idea behind it that I don't, didn't want to break Sigma support uh, just by adding support for WSL. This made me question the, uh, yeah, the viability of this approach. And yeah, uh, even if many external uh, libraries and stuff are optional, not everything is. So either you have a, to use a system component or, or compile it as part of LibreOffice. And at some point, I just had to add support for the uh, uh, for the external libraries. And this is where I hit a roadblock uh, that would uh, turn out to be a blessing in disguise, and uh, it's a uh, pearl of all things. Uh, there's a different way to configure pearl uh, in which it should handle file path. 
And uh, OpenSSL just insists on having a Perl that uh, uses a, a window style path. And uh, patching the build system of an external is always very flaky and might change with the next update. And so I just certainly didn't want to do major changes to the externals and how they work. So I instead looked around for alternative solutions and found it in the means of a strawberry Perl. This is a, a Windows version of Perl that behaves as expected from uh, OpenSSL points of view and is also available as a portable distribution so it doesn't uh, conflict with anything else you have on your system. You just chuck it into a directory and uh, can use it from there but without uh, impacting the rest of your system. And yeah, uh, this of course uh, made it uh, no longer necessary to call a Perl from within WSL. So this uh, cleared up lots of calls uh, by just using the strawberry Perl runtime instead, not just for OpenSSL but in other places. And that in turn uh, saved me from quoting path for the, for the make shell invocation and then to make sure to convert them to the uh, WSL uh, convention using the mount point uh, style of path. And uh, as a side effect, it also comes with uh, some additional tools that uh, I also then didn't have to call from within WSL, like for example the resource compiler or a linker tool. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, a blessing in disguise uh, turns out because yeah, that uh, allowed me to strip a lot of uh, special casing in the, in the new build uh, uh, portion of uh, our make files. And then another blessing, I found uh, the magic invocation on how to disable the path conversion that MSYS does. And yeah, this was really the, the breakthrough in quotes that made me uh, have confidence in this whole thing again. This made the make files so much cleaner and it started to look pretty clean and I had no doubts anymore that I can uh, make it work uh, without breaking uh, the second way of building. And yeah, uh, I of course uh, as a release engineer am focused on also providing the uh, installation sets and this was uh, the last thing that needed fixing and um, again, this was surprisingly easy again. It just was tedious because uh, the install set code is Perl in disguise only. It's not using Perl way of doing things. It's just using Perl language. And uh, it's uh, unnecessarily convoluted and has lots of leftovers from ages ago that are not longer used and make uh, finding your way around uh, more complicated. And also uses the anti-patterns of uh, of removing the interesting bits of error logs. The actual error of the command that failed is omitted most of the times and this makes it annoying because then you have to dig where's the command called, uh, make it show the error message. And once you see the error message, it's usually pretty clear what needs to be actually fixed. And yeah, uh, the result of all this is that I got it to work. It, uh, I had none of those random failures that I had with uh, Sigwin, but uh, this is of course not conclusive because my build machine at home is not as powerful, uh, cannot build with that high uh, parallelism like the uh, CI machines can, and of course uh, they don't, uh, my machine doesn't do build after build after build. And uh, Unfortunately, there is a new issue that's popped up and uh, it is uh, Windows uh, tries or randomly suspends one of the XSLT processes that are used uh, during creation of help. And uh, I was really thankful, this is a wrong word, but I was relieved that it wasn't related to the WSL environment because also, I'm not sure who it was, in Mike Kaganski or maybe Noel, also head of the sequence based uh, build environment. So yeah, this is just an annoyance because the build 
uh, doesn't proceed, it just waits forever until the uh, command is either, either killed or uh, handled in, in another way. And uh, I honestly expected the build to be a little faster, but uh, it turns out it actually a slight, uh, a slight penalty of using this approach. Uh, and if you're talking about a four hour build time, it's around 10 minutes, so it's not that much of a slowdown, but still I would have expected the build to be a little faster. But yeah, it was summertime and the, my laptop was thermal throttling, so it was hard to have reliable numbers and I still need to look into uh, what exactly is causing the slowdown compared to a second build. But even if it's slower, uh, it's not significantly slower if you factor in the, the benefits of not having a build fail and need uh, to redo a whole build because of the random failures. So I still uh, want to go ahead with the approach and uh, yeah, and basically make it uh, integration ready. And yeah, there's an easy thing that can be tried still is uh, by just using WSL and see how that stands. But yeah, I couldn't get around to uh, try that yet. At least in my approach, there's nothing specific to WSL for the Windows build part. But of course, yeah, you're not getting the GUI support in this case, but for building the Windows version, that's not necessary. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, what's next? Uh, next things is to uh, uh, clean up configure and uh, uh, remove all of my nasty print style debugging stuff and make it uh, work with not my hard-coded parts, but uh, uh, yeah, make it happily coexist with Sigwin way. And I'm thinking of keeping the post-processing of config host MK because it's much easier approach. If it was all handled in configure, you basically have to duplicate every Sigwin section and the Windows handling in, in the configure is already so, so vast, so I'd rather avoid that. But, yeah, I'm not uh, fixed on that yet, but uh, at least it looks to be the, the simple option. And yeah, uh, and of course I need to actually put it through its paces by using the same hardware where the errors with Thickwin pop up. And uh, this requires me to deploy uh, Windows 10 or 11 on the build machines first, and then I can do a, a larger scale test uh, by looping the build, basically. And uh, replacing the current Windows baseline is on the on the is planned anyway because uh, the current uh, systems, uh, which are Windows uh, Server 2012 R2, are reaching their end of life. So I will be switching to Windows 11 anyway, and yeah, then I can test the uh, Sigwin versus WSL performance on on the on the real CI setup. Yeah, and uh, I think I. In time, just in time. So, if you have questions, I'll be around. So, or maybe uh, Stefan, you can come down and set up already. Then. Yeah, any questions while uh, Stefan sets up his talk? Any questions? Yeah. Thank you.